Yeah, call Jim. Is Pruitt? I don't know what he wants. Hey, Pruitt, what's up? Hey, we, uh, we're, we're still playing today, right? What? Playing? Uh, playing uh, yeah, D the game, D&D. Playing D&D playing yeah, what, what? today. Yeah, I thought that was on Sunday. What what day is it? Yeah, it's Sunday. It's that's that's today. You that's filled today? it out like on remember with, Yeah, the remember the wind to meet that we did last week? So we were no. like, hey no, I don't remember that. What, well, I mean all the it? all the Yeah, there's all the it says four out of four, all dark green today. That's what we decided. No, I don't remember I mean, that at all. Like, like I'm, I'm outside like right now. You're outside? Are you here? No, I'm gone, man. Besides, we're not even supposed to meet in the house at the same time anymore. You know, like I'm out. We're out. But your, but your cars, your cars. You know what? Never mind. Okay, cool. That's fine. No worries. Hey, we'll just uh, some other time. It's, yeah, yeah, some no other time. Yeah. See you Sunday. Kay. Yep. <sighs> okay. Welcome everyone to WebDM Talks and Jim. Let's talk about something here. Yeah. Let's talk about burnout. Let's do it. Let's, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's, what, uh, how do you know? How do you know <laughs> when it's time to talk about burnout, Jim? Yeah. Oh, you just can't even, um, it happens, right? Burnout just happens and in many ways. It's sort of like a condition of modern life. Like <laughs> just is, is kind of a, an ever present, uh, thing. So I think it, you know, it's a fact of life for many, many people. And I think when it comes to like <clears throat> being gamers and nerds and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, there's a passion there that that drives a lot of the interest in the things you're, you know, passionate and interested in. Right. And that has a tendency to magnify the effects of burnout because you just want to like, give me, give me, give me. Oh, my God, I'm new to I'm new to RPGs. I'm new to d and I want all of it. Give me all of everything. You know, I watch the streams. I got the thing. I got all the books, the collectors, all that. Like, I got to do this. I got to have all of it. And that's can be very fun, very uh, satisfying. But it's like it's going to contribute to burnout. And I think it's easy to forget yeah. that RPGs are a luxury. RPGs and, and being able to play RPGs and being able to prepare for them and being involved with with sort of the aspect of play and, and everything. It's a luxury. It's something that you do when you have the time and energy to do. It sucks if you can't. Like It really sucks. And mm -hmm. RPGs might be a way that you refresh yourself. And if that's the case, it's worthwhile like considering what you can do to uh, you know, identify and manage burnout in your life as it relates to to gaming and RPGs. Yeah, because I think that a lot of people, they see their, their gaming and their hobbies as a way to refill their tank. Sure. sure. And the Many thing is, is, yeah. is, yeah, for it is, but still, any passion in anything is in and of itself a tank that needs to be refilled. So hmm. if you're always thinking of, oh, well, I got to play games so I can refill my tank and feel better, but it's like, no, 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 that in and of itself has its own tank and it can run out as well. And I mean, it's yeah. to me, it, it, it's happened to almost every single person I've ever played with. Almost every single person I've known at some point, certainly they, they get to that point where they're just like, I have nothing. I, I don't, I don't, I got nothing. I yeah. think about the game and nothing happens. Right. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. You're not going to get rid of it. Chances are maybe you're, you're fortunate or, or in a position to, and thinking less in terms of like eliminating it and more in terms of managing, right? Like yes. there's just some things that are beyond your control. You know, mm -hmm. and and looking at it in terms of like, all right, I want to go forward. I got to live with this fact. I got to live with this source of stress or, or whatever. Um, but I want to continue. I don't want to cut gaming out. It's doing something for me. Mm -hmm. So managing yeah. it and figuring out how to live with a, you know, find a new equal, equilibrium to, so that you can live with it. And it almost always involves scaling back and simplifying. Right. Um, more more often than not, because I, I will say this, I think once we as a group quit having longer sessions, uh, especially once we like once you did the thing of like we're playing on Sunday, Sunday's our day. Let's try to start by two, and let's play. Yeah, and then and and we would do that just so we had more of the day to start the session. Yeah, but like we, I noticed that we started playing less and less. Yeah. like you know we used to play six eight hours. 
And then we started scaling it back to four to six hours. And then we started scaling yeah. it back to where we'd play about four. And then it yeah. was three to four hours was usually what, what we finally found. And everybody was happier because we weren't like using those last two hours to try to force in more gaming, but everybody's mentally drained and everybody's like yeah. not really in it. And once you get rid of that and you realize like, no, I have a good time playing three to four hours. Boom. Yeah, we boom. like we'd get done and we'd hang out and just talk and yeah. and just have a little after game you know party sesh whatever yeah. and in like it just to me it enriched everyone like we we had a, a little bit of a renaissance in that era once we like Certainly. hit those sundays from like two to six yeah. um and well, it's people uh, yeah so i mean and, yeah they, then not yeah. everybody can stay that late and ha and like even though you might set aside a big block of time to game having it not all of that time be taken up with gaming easing into a yeah. session giving yourself a break you know for what i find with online play now is that like i need more breaks than i would if i was in person gaming i gotta get up stretch my legs i've got to take my earbuds mm -hmm. out i gotta stop staring at a screen you know i want to be engaged but i sometimes feel that pressure of like eh, should i leave like i don't want people to think i don't like i'm mad or whatever <laughs> like having yeah a sort of blanket rule of like, nope, I'm going to, you're going to get up whenever you need to go to the bathroom, get something to eat, walk away, like try not to on your turn or by, like before your turn, if it's combat or, but even yeah, then, yes. <laughs> even then just like, Hey, it's a quick, whatever. I want to do this. Somebody else resolve it, <laughs> you know, um, uh -huh. is a good, uh, a good thing for that. But yeah, shorter sessions. I'd, I'd rather have two to three hours of amazing gaming than four to five of, of just a dud <laughs> you know um that that a shorter more focused uh session where i'm really engaged and and sometimes it's less than that sometimes it's like i got an hour in me but you're going to get that hour you know uh is a way to continue gaming continue that feeling of participation of the game progressing and moving forward you're getting things done but you're not like taxing yourself with it yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I need a, a cool down period after a game. Like I am amped. Yeah. After it doesn't matter how yeah. uh, worn out I was when I came into this session. By the end of it, I'm going to be like pumped. Game mm -hmm. whether, I'm D, whether I'm DMing or playing a character, and so like understanding that, like, hey, I have a tendency to stay up really late <laughs> if we end the game past a certain point, ten or eleven at night. You know, I don't want to do that, but like I'm wired. So being yep. able to like anticipate that and, and account for it and, and maybe plan for it with shorter games ending earlier is a, a way to manage that, you know? Yeah. Give you some time to uh, do some cooldown stretches so you don't cramp up. Um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, and also uh, not only shorter sessions, but sometimes maybe, you know, does your, we used to game like multiple times a week back in yeah. the day. <clears throat> And uh, scaling back to once a week was great. And sometimes yeah. maybe that's even that, like if you're, if you're having scheduling issues, don't schedule every week and then set yourself up for that disappointment you know you're going to have. Yeah. You know, just schedule every other week. And that way there's right. plenty of time to get everybody on the same page. We're going to meet at this time. Um, because it's, it's, to me, it's more, yeah, like you said, it's, it's better to have it good than try to have more that's bad um, yes that's a tough lesson for me to learn because it's like i want that I, I want the every day i try to like recapture something i had when i had a lot of time and it wasn't you know a lot of burnout in my life but what i like in this moment is is to say like okay this is our meeting time every week this is our commitment to each other that that we're going to keep the spot open we're going to do what we can to meet but we're also going to check in every week and make sure that's what we want and, and having that sort of best of both worlds where you can assume this block of time is the time for gaming, but you're not going to assume that it's happening, right? This is your reservation spot, but every week it's like, no, I, I need that for something else. Even if it's at the last minute, like five minutes before we're about to play, hit that Zoom link. Hey guys, I'm not feeling it. You know, I, I, I feel like I will just be a, a drag, not, I don't have it in me. And that being okay, right? That being okay with everyone. And that many times needs to be continually reinforced and continually stated openly that like, it is okay to say no, right? It is okay to be like, yeah, I, I just can't 
do it this week. That that's not anything mm-hmm. other than you've reached your limit. You know, so fewer sessions. You know, I, I find that most of my gaming, yeah, I either play like three out of the four weeks of a month or half of the weeks of a month. You know, and, and there are some games that I will, you know, cross hell and high water to play uh, because I love them that much. And even those, it's not every week. There's all there's some weeks we just can't. And, you know, yeah. it is what it is, you know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sort of a, a compliment to that is like, if you're going to play shorter sessions, if you're going to play fewer sessions, then like focus in on what you want out of those. You know, if mm-hmm. you're the dungeon master or a ref or something like, what is it you are ready to do this time? What is it that you are excited? You're pumped about? What is it that you've prepped for? And then on the player side and understanding that like, maybe we don't do every little thing we think of, maybe every harebrained scheme and whatever that we just keep it in our back pocket <laughs> yeah. that that we're not like chasing after every loose end and, and, and whatever where that we're more focused in our goals in in what we do in a session that there's less dithering less speculation less just hemming and hawing over decision and a commitment to just be like look we're doing this thing and we have we'll leave ourselves a window of time to make a decision to to figure out what we want to do but once we've decided that's it it's locked into place we're doing it that makes it easier to dm make less frustration for players because there are those players who are just like can you guys come on they usually play the ones who during that moment initiate some kind of action or conflict because they're just frustrated that there's too much talk yeah and you got a leroy jenkins that show (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And like sit around all day and talk or we can get in and get some ass. We can get in and get something done, you know, (laughs) and like that also requires a DM to not be overly punitive because I find a lot of the time that sort of decision, you know, making that that churn, that that treadmill of like, should we, what can we do? Can we do this? Well, we got to make sure it's perfect comes from, uh, you know, a, a fear or an anxiety or worry on the player's part of like, we could mess this up if we don't have everything buttoned up this could go badly that's why kind of fifth Mm -hmm. edition works because it's like really forgiving and you can kind of do things (laughs) half-assed and and be okay because like it it fifth edition does a really good job of making you seem like you're in trouble of making it seem like you're like this is coming in by the by the skin of your teeth kind of thing when in actuality it's not necessarily and you guys had this in the bag yeah. by the end of round two, you know, like yeah. that yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> For the most part. Yes. Right, right. And, and cutting out the middle stuff. Like I, I'm kind of going against some of my own advice and preferences here. I like the little things. I love encumbrance. I'll track it even if I'm the only one. Like keeping track of my rations, how much food I've got, how long it takes to get somewhere. I like those things. They make the game come alive to me. They make it more real and, and they constrain me in a way that I find exhilarating and creatively satisfying. It's not for everybody. But a lot of people see those things as the boring parts, as the parts that they want to cut out. If that's you, if that's your group, then do it. Start your adventure at the dungeon door. Start your adventure in that moment of negotiation that you're building up towards. Rope in the players. How did we get here? So as a dungeon master, it's not all on you. You can throw it to the group and go like, this is our adventure. This is where we're going to start. Why don't you tell me how you got here? You know, here's the parameters. Here's the setup. I don't know all the details. Let's figure this out together. And it kind of reinforces the collaborative nature of an RPG in the sense that we're all building on each other's ideas and, and, and sort of inspirations and contributing to the whole. And it also lessens the burden on one person. You know, it, it, it kind of like spreads the the uh, responsibility around a bit um, and helps you yeah. create a more focused game. Oh, most definitely. Um, uh, and we, we, we talked about this uh, in creating a more focused game um, that will help the DM uh, simplify their prep. Yeah. Uh, if you're not having to worry about all these extra threads that the players are going to run down. And it's not necessarily saying like, and I, I think these two these two points kind of go go alongside one another. Um, we're not talking about like railroading them, 
We're just talking about being clear and specific in the goals that they themselves, they're like, we're going to do this. Okay, so you are going to do this because you want to, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and, and knowing and like presenting to them like, you know, the ramifications of their actions. Mm-hmm. I don't think that that's a bad thing. And it's okay no. for the for the yeah. I think that that and, and this may be its own show in and of itself. When we talk about player agency, it exists on multiple levels. There's sort of like the strategic campaign level of you can go anywhere you want, do whatever you want. It's all open to you. I love that style. <clears throat> I like playing it, I like running it. But I don't always have it in me to do that. Then there's sort of the middle style uh, of agency where it's like, all right, This is what we're doing. This is my setup. This is the hook, whatever. How you approach it is up to you. I'm open to any, Mm -hmm. so you can direct, indirect, whatever plays to your strengths, whatever you're feeling like today, that's fine. But we're doing this thing. And then there's the level of like the tactical player agency, which is, all right, we're doing the thing. We've decided that this is how you're going to approach it. But in that encounter, in that scene, all bets are off. You can play however you want. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people play at that tactical level of like combat. I can do what I want. There's a lot of options, a lot of ways to interact with the system. And they're happy to go along to get along at those upper two tiers. You know, they don't want the burden <laughs> to decide where they want to go in this infinite sandbox <laughs> or like mm-hmm. which of the hooks that's presented is going to be the one that leads to a satisfying adventure. They're perfectly happy to say, DM, I want to play the one you're ready to play. And, and I'll, mm-hmm. I'm going to give it my all in that. And guess what? Like, as much as I love Sandbox, as much as I prize player agency, there's a good bit of the time where I'm like, yeah, whatever you want to do, man, I'm, I'm here to play what you're ready to run. And yeah. to realize that, like, I'm getting on this train voluntarily because I want to go somewhere. Yep. And I that's okay. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> you know? And that does tie into simplifying prep. Because now the, the DM can, if they know from their players, this is okay. You don't, we don't need everything to be sort of mapped out and, and, and go everywhere or whatever. Then it frees the dungeon master up to like focus at what it is that they want and simplify. And part of the simplification is, is why, you know, we recommend so many things like random tables, tools, procedures. They take some of that mental load off the dungeon master and you can just go you know what let's see what the dice have to say about this you know you did want to go off in a direction i wasn't ready for i've prepared for that by having this set of random tables as well as a procedure for what that looks like you can travel x number of distance in this time period that's going to trigger this many possible events and we're just going to roll to find out this might be nothing Mm -hmm. and then we'll try it again or there might be something there and we're going to accept that it's not as deep and it's not as involved and it's not as tied to everything as we might like mm-hmm. it, but it's maybe in hindsight, it can be. Once we've done it, yeah. we can go like, you know what? Maybe those bandits were connected to the bad guy that we're doing. Or maybe that dragon that we ran into is allied with our, you know, is, is part of this organization we've been trying to get in touch with. Let's follow up on that. And that's kind of a way of working in a, a broader and more well-connected world that doesn't put all the burden on the dungeon master, even if it might seem mm-hmm. like it's weird that you're justifying it after the fact, you know, rather than yeah. discovering this about the world, you're crafting it after it's already happened. Yeah, play style mm-hmm. difference. I don't always like that, but if it's that or no well, gaming, then I'll, I'll put up with my things that yeah, are not I mean, my absolute y- preferences. Yeah. I mean, being able to adapt to new yeah. things like that's not just in life or you know for your character at the table that's also for the player at the table is altering how you play mm-hmm. because you can still find those moments that you really want if you just go ahead and at least try to go along with what everybody's doing because you might look up and find out hey i'm normally a power gamer that wants to drop big damage but i'm having a hell of a time at this ball because right. everybody, because you're walking in with the leverage of like, oh, that's that guy who can really fight. Like, like learning how to use that leverage of your of what your character can do in social situations can be as gratifying as doing what your character can do in combat situations. Like, right. I, I don't know. It, it took it took a while to learn that lesson, but once I did, I'm glad. Yeah, and 
Oops. And if you're thinking of like complementing a dungeon master's play style as a player, like having a dungeon master who is ready to go like, okay, I'm confident enough with what I know about the system to roll with that. And again, this is why fifth edition is great because what do you need to know? Like you don't know what to do, you don't know whatever, an ability check. Roll me this stat. Is it DC 10, 15 or 20? I don't know, let's see. And that's all you really need. Everything else is superfluous. Everything else is just icing on the cake. That ability check versus one of those three DCs will get you very far in fifth edition. And the players come up with something off the wall that you're not ready for, or the player's trying to do something creative that there's not a set of rules for. Ability check, DC 10, 15, or 20. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And having that confidence and that understanding, and that's like that's like a bare minimum of rules mastery, just knowing that it exists gives you the freedom to be like, you know what? We don't need all this extra stuff right now. The fact that one of the players who's playing a combat optimized character wants to do this other thing, that's okay. I'm going to ask him to roll a d20 and see what happens. And especially if you combine that with an attitude of failure does not stop the game. Failure leads to more gaming, complications that propel things forward. Yeah, you didn't convince that person. It doesn't mean it just fell flat. You guys go your separate ways or whatever. Now they know they're coming after you, you know, or, yeah. or, or you've revealed too much of yourself and the enemy knows something. It's going to mean something for the game. And... I, you know, sort of a compliment to this or or an alternate uh, way of looking at it is picking a game where there's a default mode of play. The best example of this is the Mega Dungeon. The Mega Dungeon exists because if you don't know what to do, you can always go in the dungeon and look for some treasure. If you don't have anything else you want to do, if there's no one who has a strong preference, you get a bunch of retainers or hirelings or, or other party members, you gear up, mm -hmm. you go in the dungeon and see what's there. And maybe dungeon crawling is not for you. But thinking about your game in terms of a default mode, a, a thing that like, if we have nothing else to do, we do this, is very helpful because it gives the DM something to fall back on. It lets them know like, okay, regardless of what we're doing, I, I have to be ready for this. And it takes the pressure off of everybody to just be like, all right, <laughs> we don't want to have to make a decision about this right now. We just want to roll some dice. We just want to hang out with our friends. We just want to connect and, and, and do something with this game. And I'm here to tell you guys that I've played in some like hack and slash bare bones dungeon crawling that ended up becoming highly <laughs> emotional and like the emotional investment and the character connections and and the interactions with the world they emerge from that style of play mm -hmm. this is the where the hobby started and we've ended up in this place where everybody's like wanting character development and connection and, and everything that grew out of a style that was let's get some fighters and magic users and go break down this door that's why D, &D exists in the first place is because war gamers yep. wanted a connection with their characters so that will happen if you give it the space for it you know well you got to baptize them in fire first and see how they bond i mean that's the whole thing so throwing them in the fire early is a way to develop that create that character that bonding after the fact like you don't have to have a whole thing at the table up front before yeah. you go adventure to make sure that I know I want to go adventure with this person, you know, yeah. roommates and yeah. apartments don't start living together, you know, sometimes just because <laughs> they know them. I mean, yeah, that Dan can't happen, but sometimes you pick a random person, you start living with them and you go through some stuff. And then all of a sudden you got a friend at the end. Same. Right. Thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, and like all of like, most of these things relate to each other and, and sort of reinforce each other and, and create a sustainable game for yourselves. And, and like, overall, it's like, it's about altering goals for play. It's about recalibrating your expectations. And, and a lot of that is, is difficult to do, especially if you're coming from a time where you could play more and you could play for longer and there was way more investment. And now somebody's schedule changed. Somebody's got something going on at work. You've got, you've got something going on yourself, sick, worried, other obligations. Being able to go, you know, I like a wide variety of things. I'm not just one kind yeah. of player. And and growing yourself and it branching out as a gamer to have different expectations of the game that are adjustable, different ways to approach it, different things you want out of the game, 
gives you a broader range of options when you can't give 100% or can't give as much as you'd like to still continue, to still have that continuity of play, to have something, even if it's just a little bit of what you would like. And that's very important. Yeah. And a lot of the reason why like playing other games is important because you learn that about yourself. I didn't used to be a story gamer. I'm still kind of not, but I can enjoy them. If all I've got is a story game, I'll play it. It'll be fun. I'll like, I'll get into it. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to play it like it's D and D, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and so it'll be bit, from a yeah. different <laughs> play style. But I'm in on it. You, you'll get what I've got, you know, and and that can be enough sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I guess probably the last last little bit here to try to make yeah. sure you can shake things up is uh, switching up those roles. Yeah, Whether they be. I think it's it's whether you you know what do you normally play the fighter? Why don't you just switch over to a mage or a cleric? Or yep. are you that player that maybe has had an inkling to DM? Because yep. I I know that your DM probably really wants to play. That's Certainly, usually yeah. oh, always God. been the case. Yeah. And so giving it a go and shaking things up, I mean, I, yeah. I, it, it's priceless whenever it works. Very much, yeah. Switching things up in terms of, uh, you know, your party role, what you play, who you play is, is, you know, is is everybody playing the same kind of type of character and that's making it more difficult to the DM. And maybe you say like, you know what, we're missing this kind of character. Can I re-roll, play this one? But especially the peripheral stuff in the game, scheduling, uh, you know, prepping for the game. If, if you feel like you can, even just a one shot, even if it's just like this week, I cannot run, I cannot do this. Can one of you play? Can one of you run a game? Right? Can one of you prep something and be ready? Like you, you know, you don't have to be ready to take on the full campaign. Sometimes all it takes is one session of, of easing the DM of that burden and, and understanding that like there's a really low bar for you if you're stepping in to fill those shoes once. And that's not because you suck. It's because there's a really low bar for most people to enjoy the game right like yeah when your players tell you oh yeah we had fun they're not lying to you most likely they're just expressing the fact that yeah like i'm just happy to be here roll some dice and hang out a lot of times that's me you know and if you're stepping into the dm's shoes briefly don't put that pressure on yourself this isn't about like you burning out to prevent somebody else burning out it's about like hey i got what do i got in me i got a bandit cave you know <laughs> i've got i've got you know, if you can link it to the main campaign, then that's great. It kind of continues that continuity. But even if it's not, gives the players an opportunity to play a different character, gives the DM a chance to play, takes the pressure off for a week, shakes things up. Maybe next week you come back, everybody's refreshed. Uh, and so switching up those roles, switching up the burden of play, because it can be a burden, is a good way to manage mm -hmm. uh, burnout and uh, keep the game going, right? Keep playing. Well, I mean, long term. Yeah. Uh that's the, I mean, that is always the goal just to keep playing. Um, and whatever it takes, uh, it's not just an Avengers thing. It's, sure. it's, it's a D and D too. Um, <laughs> it's very good. Very good. <laughs> um, so, uh, seriously, if you enjoy this conversation, uh, you should come on over to Patreon. Uh, we got a, weekly podcast of just us talking for like an hour hour and a half every week so it's a whole other thing uh, ad free um so you know and we also answer questions from the patreon patrons yeah. so you know you could uh you could have jim uh you know tell you uh his wildest desires certainly nobody's asked certainly. that yet it's very weird nobody has i'll so. tell you anyway <laughs> <laughs>